Thank you very much, Chris, Richard, my esteemed co-editors, first authors, and audience members. I'm going to be presenting on the global epidemiology of HIV among female sex workers and talk about the influence of structural determinants. And thanks all to all of my co-authors. The HIV burden among female sex workers is considerable. Although it is extremely heterogeneous uh, globally, that female sex workers have approximately a 13.5 times more likely to be HIV positive than the general population. And despite decades of research and program activity, the epidemiology of HIV and structural determinants in sex work remains very poorly understood. There have been calls to action from researchers and uh, program uh, persons because behavioral and biomedical interventions alone have only had a modest impact on the HIV epidemic among sex workers, and this has called for a better understanding of the structural determinants, which led us to our review. We conducted a systematic review of available epidemiologic data on HIV and female sex work, and we reviewed the role of structural determinants. We then conducted a uh, series of models that were informed by our literature review and the gray literature, and these were deterministic transmission dynamic models to determine the prevention potential of structural interventions to avert HIV epidemics among female sex workers in three settings, Kenya, India, and Canada. In terms of our systematic review, we considered all published studies between 2008 to 2013 and included HIV or STIs or condom use outcomes. We considered over 3,200 papers. The majority of the studies that we examined were from lower and middle income countries, 93%, and the data were disproportionately found from Asia. However, there were major gaps in, this, in the literature with respect to um, countries that had the highest burden of HIV among female sex workers, specifically those in Sub-Saharan Africa, Russia, and Eastern Europe, and this is where we need absolutely more data. Less than 50% of the published studies that we examined set out to examine structural determinants, and yet most of them identified at least one determinant that was at the macro, meso, or micro level. Just to highlight a few of these, given the time constraints today, we found that HIV risks were potentiated in settings where HIV was, uh, sex work was criminalized, where there were punitive laws and policies around sex work, where law enforcement strategies and local policing strategies would drive sex workers away from safer um, sex work environments, and where gentrification of red light districts occurred. And here is a quote from Vancouver that speaks to how sex workers are being moved away from safer locations and a, a photo from a protest in this city. We also found that HIV risk was elevated in cases where there was suboptimal access to safe, appropriate sexual health care, condoms, HIV testing, and utilization of antiretroviral therapies. And here is a quote from Kenya about a sex worker who was going forward to the clinic, and when they discovered that she was a sex worker, that she was turned away. Clearly, this is a human rights violation, and this kind of activity must stop. We've also found that sex work environments that reduce HIV risks were those where there were supportive work environment policies, such as managerial pro policies that uh, promoted safer transactions between clients and sex workers, and where there was community empowerment. And here is a quote from a transgender sex worker in Karnataka, where she is talking about driving out clients that were violent. We then conducted a, a series of models and in this case, um, we considered a number of structural determinants. Here, we will see that um, the um, most risky HIV environment were those on the street, followed by informal indoor venues and then um, formal sex work establishments. And we considered in this case, structural factors were those that were in the work environment. So in Vancouver, these factors included um, the um, injection drug use that was prevalent in this community. In Kenya, we considered binge drinking. And in India, we considered sex work collectives.
We also considered the fact that violence, as we've heard through the voices of sex workers and in uh, Richard's opening remarks, was particularly pervasive and could potentiate HIV risks. There were different kinds of violence and harassment that we considered. We considered police harassment, client violence, and also violence coming from intimate partners. And we um, considered that violence could have both an immediate and a sustained effect on condom use, and this could drive HIV risk behaviors. And so we included in the model, based on available data, the uh, history of police harassment or client sexual or physical violence in Vancouver, in Kenya, recent workplace sexual violence, and in India, workplace violence um, occurring um, that was both physical or sexual violence, as well as the confiscation of condoms from the police that were using them as proof of sex work and um, um, criminalization. The first finding from Vancouver, Canada, was um, that exposure to any future client violence and police harassment would have a limited effect. And this is because there's a modest impact due to the sustained negative or historical effects of sexual violence. The next finding was that there was also a modest impact due to the combined frequent and iterative effects of client physical violence and police harassment. Yet in settings where we consider uh, supportive environments where both the historical exposure to sexual violence and the future violence could be um, taken into account, for example, through peer counseling or taking into account PTSD, that we could reduce uh, HIV incidents among female sex workers and their clients over a 10-year horizon by over 20%. But the most impressive reductions in HIV incidents in this setting were actually those where we promoted a safer work environment through our modeling um, scenarios. And this is through the combined effect that in reduction of violence, police harassment, and the promotion of safer work policies. And in particular, full decriminalization of sex work could reduce HIV incidents among female sex workers and clients by 33% over the next 10 years, which is impressive indeed. In Mombasa, Kenya, we examined the elimination of exposure to sexual violence from clients and police, and we found that um, about a 17% reduction in HIV incidents could occur with the reduction of sexual violence alone in this um, context. And due to the fact that there is stigma and discrimination that drives sex workers away from prevention and care, that promotion of peer and sex worker-led outreach could reduce HIV incidents among sex workers and clients by about 20% over the next 10 years. Importantly, however, in this setting, Mombasa, Kenya is a generalized HIV epidemic, so access to antiretroviral care and adherence is clearly important. And if we were to promote this biomedical intervention alongside these structural changes, we would see over a 30% reduction in HIV incidence among sex workers and their clients. And similarly to the Vancouver situation, also promoting a safer work environment and full decriminalization of sex work would also have a significant impact on the HIV incidence of female sex workers and their clients with a 31% reduction in full decriminalization. And here, the impact on um, reducing violence through um, binge drinking and its impact on inconsistent condom use was also very important. In Bellary, India, we also modeled the same kinds of structural determinants, but in this setting, many of you will be familiar with the Avahan Project, which has already considerably reduced HIV incidence through a number of structural interventions. And so the additional impact that, the, um, ad that additional structural interventions would be relatively modest. But in this setting, we found that safer work environments and de full decriminalization of sex work could reduce HIV incidence by 46%. In closing, there are a number of policy and program implications from these uh, presentations and, and the modeling that we conducted. Clearly, there is a need for structural change to have a major impact on HIV responses in sex work. We need to de decriminalize sex work. We need to eliminate the violence, police harassment, and promote safer work environments. There are major gaps in coverage and equitable access to HIV prevention and a dearth of data, so we must be scaling up these efforts in tandem with sex worker-led interventions.
And finally, if we eliminate sexual violence alone, we can avert 17 to 20 percent of HIV infections over the next decade. In heavy HIV burden settings like Mombasa, we can avert up to 34 percent of HIV infections over the next decade. And modest scale up of sex worker led outreach could avert 20 percent of these incident infections. But the most significant impact would be the full decriminalization of sex work, which could reduce up to 46 percent of incident incident infections. So therefore, our findings confirm the need for multi-pronged structural and community-led interventions alongside biomedical interventions to reduce HIV burden and promote sex workers' human rights globally. Sex work is work.